about it, give him a warm, big welcome round of applause. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, welcome. Uh, this is going to be near space exploration. Uh, real quick about me, uh, I'm an undergrad at Cal Poly Pomona doing electrical engineering. Woo! I don't even know what our mascot is. Um, I work for JPL uh, doing software. Yeah, boo, JPL. No. no. Um, software, uh, and I work very closely with people who test spacecraft hardware. Um, I've worked on previous projects, robotics and whatnot. And as a very important disclaimer, I am not here representing JPL or NASA. All opinions and information is public and my own. Yeah, I know. Uh, it's, it's just legal crap. OK, so the real question is, what is near space, right? Uh, space doesn't actually exactly have a beginning. Um, they define it to be somewhere around 300,000 feet. Um, and near space is about a third of that, at 100,000 feet. So. It's pretty much everything within the stratosphere. Uh, whoop. OK. So and if you go up there, you could take pretty pictures like this. Uh, and a few years ago, I guess back in 2010, um, which I'll get into in a little bit, uh, I decided I want a really cool like, wallpaper like that. So I did all of this just to get a really cool wallpaper. <laughs> Priorities. So the question is, what is a HAB? And I'm going to be mentioning HABs um, throughout the talk. And the, it stands for high altitude balloon. Essentially what it is is a balloon filled with a lifting gas, like helium or hydrogen, and a parachute and a payload. And the concept behind it is you have your payload connected to a parachute, connected to the balloon. You let it go. And the balloon rises up, and as the pressure above gets, you know, as you rise up, the pressure decreases. The balloon gets bigger and bigger, and these balloons are engineered to burst at a certain altitude if you fill it correctly. Um, the balloon pops, and it's designed to shred apart, and your payload comes streaming down until there's enough air for the parachute to deploy, and it gently lands, and you can pick it up. Um, so. A flight path looks something a lot like this. This is, I think this is actual real data from a, uh, from a flight um, where you let it go and the winds kind of, they push you a lot. It's not going to go straight up and back down. Um, especially when you get to the jet stream, it really kicks it and the little squiggle you see near the peak is where it hits the, the stratosphere where there's, and the jet streams where there's lots and lots of wind. Um, and then it nicely lands somewhere. Um, so, by the way, that's the Salton Sea down there by the, by the left bottom side. So that kind of gives you a bit of a scale of how big this is. Um, and from the ground, this is if you were at the Salton Sea looking at it, um, the Salton Sea is pretty big. So, uh, yeah, so you could see what a flight path would look like from the ground. Okay, I'll slow down a bit. So, a uh, little bit of history, because as I go through this, I'm going to be talking about what we've done and what we're about to do. Uh, Habix 1, back in 2010, uh, this was the first attempt I did. Um, and there weren't many collaborators other than myself. And we launched that back in 2010, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, okay, they're, like, in terms of the payload, come on, hold on, give me a second. Don't. Like, in terms of what was built. Habix 2, on the other hand, had a much bigger team, a huge team. Um, in terms of what was put into this little box. Um, that, no. Other than the launch and recovery. Yeah, OK. Yeah, they're heckling. All right. Uh, Habix 2. And then what we're about to launch, Habix 3, or no, Habix Pico. So uh, the pink box up here, and I'm going to show it later when I get to the slides, uh, is Habix 2. And then Habix Pico is what we're going to be launching in about an hour outside by the pool. So we're actually going to launch one, and it's really small. It's like little Sputnik, yeah. Um, so what were the goals? So if you're going to do a, a high altitude balloon, you really have to have goals, right? You, you want to do something with this. And it is a little expensive. So the, the, the simplest thing you can do, and what's important is to have a, a, a tracking system. The, you, you can let these things go, but you need to know where they're going. And it needs to tell you where it is. 
Um, so a lot of people, like what we're going to be doing today with Habix Pico is just a simple tracker. It has a GPS and it reports back its location so we know where it's going and where it's going to end up landing. Um, and then you can, you know, piggyback things into your payload like a camera, uh, science, like a science payload so you can measure stuff while you're up there. Um, there's all sorts of stuff you can do, take pictures. A really cool idea was, excuse me, doing a solar eclipse, like during a solar eclipse letting one go, because that would look really, really cool. Um, and RF hackery, whatever you want to do, there's, once you're up in line of sight to all these radios on the ground, there's probably some really neat things you could do, but I haven't done them yet. Uh, the f other important thing, well, the one, one thing you need to think about is your friends and money. Um, it's a really good idea to collaborate with people when you're working on these sort of projects, uh, mostly because uh, you, checking each other is a very important thing. So someone looking over your design is a very good idea. Um, having a redundant radio that someone else builds is a very, very good idea. Um, having people help track these, these last two, the last two we did, we had a huge team of people show up to the desert on their own time and actually help us chase this uh, payload around the desert. Um, and then uh, contributing parts and money and whatnot. So really you have to set up a budget and you, your budget's really limited on what you can do out of wallet or you can talk to your school or whatnot and maybe get some funding. But your costs kind of fall into these three categories. You could do a low cost one like what we're going to be doing today for about 100 to $300, um, which is a simple tracker and maybe a really small camera. Uh, you can do something a, a Habix 2 is not real. Actually, Habix 2 is a lot bigger than that. Um, a medium size, which may be a little bigger than the Pico. You might have like a nicer camera inside and um, a little bit of science in there. Maybe you want to throw like a Geiger counter, who knows what not. And then the I'm Rich, which is you can just use really, really nice radios, have a lot of redundancy and extra radios to, to keep that backed up and, you know, fly expensive stuff. I, I don't know exactly what you would want to fly, but you could think of that. Then you have to pick a location to launch from. Unfortunately, Southern California is a really bad place to do launches. We have way too many mountains. Um, like people out in Indiana or wherever ground is flat, um, or in the UK, uh, there's just flat land and hills. They don't exactly have mountains. Too easy. Yeah. So, <laughs> right, too easy. Um, so recovering is a lot easier and uh, you know, and, and another important thing is, like, just like any radio, if you transmit in a mountain, it's not going to go very far. So, and I'm actually going to get into that a little later. It's the story behind Havix too. So you pick your launch location. Um, you want to stay away from power lines, obviously, public interference. You want a large area to work with. And really, the launch location, for us at least, because there's so many mountains, is determined by the estimated landing location. Um, and we use, I'm going to get into in a little bit, uh, a flight predictor where you put in all the, the characteristics of your balloon, how fast you think it's going to rise, how fast you think it's going to descend, and it'll tell you where it thinks it's going to land based on using real NOAA weather data. So we look at, we have a few spots that we pick that where we want to uh, launch from, and based on where the weather says it's going to land, we pick the best one and launch from there. Uh, the important thing here is to avoid, oh, you can't see, uh, avoid military airspace and what I consider lava. Um, the map has really bad contrast, but you can see the red and the orange. Red is water and orange is really bad mountainous areas where it's really a big pain to go recover something, um, which Havix 2 decided to land in. Uh, and the green boxes are military airspace. I actually haven't looked up what the rules are of if you break that rule, but I don't want to find out. Um, just because it's military airspace. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, they just shoot you. I think so. They'll just take you out back. Uh, so, the, so the first part is the balloon, right? The balloon, uh, you can buy from two manufacturers right now. They're the big ones that sell them. Uh, Kmot and Hoi, whatever. I don't even know how to pronounce that. And it's, the balloons are made out of a special material called Totex. And this material is, is, as you can see in this picture, designed to shred apart as soon as it pops. So you don't have this big, you know, <laughs> hunk of rubber essentially just, you know, messing around and hitting your payload and parachute, not letting it open correctly. Um, and you could use tools. I have a link up there 
which lets you say, okay, I want to go to this altitude, and um, I want to go, you know, this fast, and I have this balloon, and it'll tell you how much you should fill up your balloon to. Um, and if you fill it correctly, it'll work just fine and get to that altitude, you know, within a couple thousand feet. Um, and you need to consider what your mass, the mass of your payload is, how heavy your box is, because you know the gas has to lift this mass up. Um, and there's the cost. Um, so lifting gas. Uh, the two main lifting gases are hydrogen and helium. Uh, hydrogen is cheap. It has great lift. And it's very, very available. Um, the downside is if you're smoking near it, it could explode. And that sucks. So I would, I would definitely be careful. There are procedures you could take. You just got to be really safe and con like conscious around it. Um, and helium, it won't kill you. Um, and you could launch it from almost anywhere, so you don't really have to be worried about, you know, like if you're launching in the middle of the desert and there's like a fire risk or whatnot. I really don't know exactly. Um, but the downside is it's very expensive. Since between Habix 1 and 2, in two years, the cost of helium, I think, almost doubled. So helium is, is a rare gas now almost, and it's really expensive. So if you can't go with hydrogen, it would be much better to go with hydrogen. Um, and you obviously, you're going to need the proper gas regulators and whatnot. Then the next thing is the parachute. Um, I go with sphere chutes, and these guys make really cool parachute that has a little place to, to tie on your balloon that goes up, and then you have the parachute connected to your payload. And it's made out of uh, a ripstop fabric material, so it doesn't tear apart. Um, and you could do a little bit of math. I included the math there. And you could figure out what the rate of descent is going to be. That's a very important number. So the rate of ascent, the rate of descent are very, very important numbers. Um, and it could cost anywhere from five bucks. You could probably buy at a surplus store to 60 bucks if you want to get a really nice and fancy one. OK, so the payload concept, there are three general categories. There is a Pico which is very small, what we're going to be launching today. It's about 50 grams. There's a small payload, um, and uh, what I call Murica, which is a really, really big payload. Um, and most big payloads actually have to be approved by the FAA, and you have to get a waiver and whatnot. But if you're doing something small or Pico, uh, and I'll get into a little bit of detail about how big that exactly is. Um, actually, the small is about anything under four pounds, you don't need to get checked by the FAA. You can just fly it. Um, it's a good idea to throw out a notum and just let airmen know that there's a balloon being launched and that they don't run into it. Um, and if you're in the UK, you have to let them know about smaller Murica size. But anything Pico or 50 grams or less, you don't actually have to notify. I guess they have the CCA or CAA. Uh, Murica size is what I consider <laughs> Habix 2, which is about Murica. Um, four pounds. It's very big. It has all sorts of stuff in it. And in fact, people in the UK kind of make fun of us for having such big payloads because they have to fly these small little ones. And that's their idea of what a Murica size one is. It's a motherboard, a hammer, two like lead acid batteries, and a space heater. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think they're just jealous. Uh, payload comparison this is probably the best way to describe it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so what's inside this payload? What's inside this box, right? Uh, you want, the, the one thing, that, at least that we flew in Habix 2, was obviously you need a radio. You're not going to be able to launch something and guess where it's going to land very accurately and go get it. You need a radio to repeat back, hey, I'm at this coordinate at this altitude. Um, it doesn't have to do it constantly. It may do it once it's landed. Uh, but it's always nice to know where it's going as it's flying. Um, and you want to take up a camera with you, take some pictures. Uh, do some science. I've seen everything from temperature sensors to barometers to Geiger counters to accelerometers and gyroscopes to tell how it tumbled and whatnot. So there's some really cool things you could fly in these boxes. Um, and your radios kind of fall into these five categories somewhat. There's other ways, to, there are other techniques and other uh, methods to doing it, but these are the most common. Um, AP, we have a wonderful system here called APRS. There's all these repeaters all over the country. Um, and essentially, you can, uh, it, it's a radio on 144-390. And there's a special packet that these radios are listening for that contains position of where, uh, a position. Uh, I'll explain it in the next slide, actually. 
There's a radio teletype beacon, if you guys remember radio teletype. Um, and there's certain frequencies you could do. I'm going to get into that in a little bit. You could do a cell phone with a GPS. Um, a spot, which is this product, I don't know if you guys have seen, it's like a satellite uh, position beacon. You push a button or you program it or ask it, where are you, and it'll tell you where it is anywhere around the world. Um, and then an RDF beacon, which is a radio, uh, radio direction finding beacon. Um, and that requires uh, having a, a, a transmitter that essentially puts out a tone and you use antennas to figure out which direction it is. You get three points and now you've triangulated the position of the payload. So EPRS, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, there's a bunch of digipeters across the US. Um, you construct a packet that contains your position, your call sign, uh, so you could identify it. And any of these, if any of these stations pick up that packet, it reports it online. So you could essentially just watch it uh, from the internet. Um, but you can't always rely on that. And in fact, for Habix 2, we had a bunch of cars with these stations built into them. Uh, and we would track uh, all on our own. We essentially became these towers. Uh, and you could do that either by setting up your own SDR. Uh, if you have a TNC to serial, you could do that. Um, there's an Android app now that you can just plug in your ham radio into it and it'll decode those packets. Uh, this is the coverage of the United States for APRS. There's pretty good coverage on ma main cities. Red is great coverage, blue is okay coverage, and obviously nothing is nothing. You got no coverage. Um, and this is a system we had for Habix 2, essentially a mag mount on your car to a two meter radio tuned to the correct frequency into a laptop that's decoding the packet. Uh, and then we had MIFIs and communication radios so we could talk to each other and coordinate where to go to try to get the best reception as it's landing. Uh, and your beacon looks something a lot like this. Your GPS will receive the GPS signal, send out an NMEA packet to a microcontroller. Uh, that microcontroller then uh, constructs the APRS format packet and then sends that out through a radio. So we have this one, uh, this little tracker here. It could be really, really small, or it could be very big. The one in Habix 2 is fairly large. Um, but as you can see, it has a GPS, the microcontroller, and then a radio, which is actually behind it. And then you connect an antenna to it and let it fly. Uh, yeah, this is Habix 2's radio. Um, it's a little bit bigger, and it's also very heavy. It weighed about a pound. This is about. Actually, that's about like maybe like an eighth of a pound, really, if not less than that, with the batteries. Uh, radio teletype, this is used a lot in, in the UK. Uh, and they all kind of like look out after each other and have all these stations that they put up on their own. Um, and they wrote their own software that actually takes, that listens on these frequencies and decodes them. Um, unfortunately, it's not really used in the United States. Uh, all these guys just hang out on IRC, and every time people are launching, they all just you know, set up their towers and start listening. And as you can see on the right side, in the UK and Europe, there's tons of towers. But in the United States, there'll be like a tower every now and then. Um, I'm over there in Los Angeles all alone. Um, then there's the cellular based. Uh, this was designed, uh, the one on the left side was designed by M and Charlie back there. They essentially have a cell phone uh, chip that has GPS and a cell phone uh, modem built in. And it you know, gets the GPS position and then texts you where it is. It's, it's really simple. It worked great. Um, there's another one DSS circuits makes. Uh, that was like a Kickstarter that recently succeeded. Or you could really just use an Android phone and program it to uh, send you, you know, it's the, the coordinates. Uh, and then you have R, uh, RDF beacons, radio direction finding beacons. They're really small. Uh, the one, w this is the one that was supposed to fly, but unfortunately had a bit of an accident right before flight. So ArcLight literally in I think half an hour built one from scratch out of an Arduino and like a UV4 or UV3. Um, and all you need is a direction finding antenna, a compass, and a really nice mapping software. Uh, and you could find the direction that the beacon is coming from. If you aim it this way, you don't hear it, but if you aim it that way, you hear it, you get a good fix. You got three positions or so, and you could actually you could do it with two. Um, and you could figure out where it is on the ground. So some tips and guidelines uh, I wanted to mention because this is kind of how to help 
that make sure your payload will actually survive and work. The first thing you want to do is watch your mass. Uh, mass is really important. It, if, if, you're, if you're too heavy or too light, your predictions are all going to completely change. Uh, and you have to fill your balloon differently and your parachute might have to become smaller or bigger to compensate for it. So you want to look after your mass as you're doing it, you know, measure as you go. Uh, power devices separately don't have a main battery and you know, power the whole thing because if that fails, everything fails. Um, really simple, it's just redundancy and uh, using different designs, different systems. Plenty of insulation. It gets very cold up there. I'm going to get into that in just a second. Uh, so you really want to make sure you're well insulated. Uh, do a circuit analysis if you can. Look at your tolerances. What happens if the parts get too cold or too hot? Um, how that's going to change the performance of the device. Uh, and learn to tie good knots. And test, test, test. Like, that should be like the whole point of this talk. It's, it's testing. Testing is very, very important. So space, near space gets to about negative 60 C. Uh, and outside, if you land in the desert, maybe 40 C or, or so. Um, and the pressure gets down to about 1% atmosphere. Uh, so that's, that's, uh, that's barely any pressure to work with. And there's 80 mile an hour winds, although 80, miles an hour, 80 mile an hour winds at low pressure is not going to push you a lot. Uh, but it's something to, to keep in mind. So it's going to get tumbled around, and it's going to experience a lot of Gs being kicked around up there. You have a flight time of about an hour to two hours. And unless you want to do something called a floater, which is very poorly named, um, but essentially you fill it so it becomes buoyant and stays afloat. The balloon doesn't pop. And it eventually will pop, but either it, it can last up to 24. Some guys did one, launched it from San Francisco, and it landed in Morocco. Like They did a transatlantic one. That was really cool. Um, so you just have to really calculate that out. But you want to make sure your batteries live the flight. Um, and all these elements, yeah, mountains and water and all that, if you land in water, your radio is going to die. Uh, if you hit a mountain too hard or the ground too hard, you're going to die. So there's all sorts of things you've got to worry about, the environment you're going to go through. Um, and the, good, the, the best idea uh, is to really build two radios. This one is the backup for today, and the other one is obviously inside. And this one, I have beat the living daylights out of it. I've overvolted it, undervolted it. I've killed off the GPS, um, all sorts of tests. I've modified it a lot. There are a lot of problems with it, programmed it. So I left the flight hardware alone. So once I knew exactly what to do to the test hardware, I could implement it on the final hardware, test it, and um, so on. Beat it up, test it, apply. Yep. And then you also want to plan for failures. What if your GPS cuts out, right? So now the, the radio is going to keep either you know, using the last packet it, it received from the GPS, or it's just not going to send anything out because it doesn't have position. So it's a good idea to program it to maybe go into like an RDF mode, where it just transmits a tone and defaults to something else, so you can maybe track it a different way. So it's a really good idea to think of what happens in different failure scenarios. Um, this wall of text. So essentially, if it, it, you, you guys can look through this later. This is not, I mean, I can kind of go through it. But you want to do your power calculations. You want to test your ground equipment. Essentially, just make sure everything you've set up works the way you think it works. And do dry runs. Uh, like for Habix 2, we actually drove around LA with it in Doc's car and, and had our antennas. And we, we chased the car around downtown, um, eventually to really high ground so we could actually make sure the radios work at far distances. Um, so the near space environment can kill a lot of electronics, and these are the four things you want to be careful of. Uh, wind, obviously, it, it, it can undo connections. It can break, you know, the, 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 the insulation might break off, and your electronics may dump out, you know, 100,000 feet up. Um, temperatures, when, when electronics get cold, all these parts are rated to a certain temperature. There's a temperature range which they're, you're told will, it will operate. Um, and if you go below that, the electronics may not work, and it's likely it won't work. Um, in a vacuum, what happens is there are three, obviously there are three uh, methods of heat exchange, and that's convection, conduction, and radiation. Uh, radiation is IR, it radiates in the IR. Um, conduction is a material touching another material and conducting the heat through it, and then there's convection. Convection is through air, but when you're up there, there is no air, and some parts actually rely on 
air to cool. So um, electronics can actually end up overheating because there's no air for it to dump all that heat out that it's generating. And then EMC, which is really any electromagnetics, your radios. Uh, for example, for Havix 2, we did some e EMC testing where we made sure all of it was, all the hardware was running next to each other and they weren't interfering or cross talking uh, and damaging each other. And, and it does happen. One of the, the beacons that, our RDF beacon, if it, get, if it got about a foot close to the main radio, it would actually couple to one of the, the sensitive low power RF lines and then get amplified. So the, the RDF beacon would actually go uh, uh, couple with our main radio and go out on the, the power amplifier. So you have, and, but the solution to that was to essentially separate them apart and put you know, uh, a long rope across it and that way, I mean, within five feet, there's no, that problem did not exist. So with winds, how to solve these problems? With winds, tie down, hot glue is excellent in these sort of things. Um, connectors, tape, uh, you, you really want to watch your connectors. The connector that came with the uh, radio we had was just loose, like you just plug it in and pull it apart. And in one of the tests we did, the, the shaking test, I threw it down some stairs and the connector came loose. So I ended up hot gluing it just because the connector wasn't the right type and I didn't feel like hacking around with it too much. Um, so that's something really important to watch out for. Uh, for the cold, uh, silicone, epoxy, uh, urethane, conformal coating, they sell these things for circuit boards. It's a good idea. Essentially what it does is it thermally lumps it all together. So you're not relying on convection to cool your parts. Um, and then that, using conduction against your, your insulation will dissipate the heat pretty well. Um, and EMC, uh, it's just a good idea to put all your radios together, as close together as possible, and test that. And if you're running into problems, then you gotta, you gotta figure out how to fix that. Um, roping them apart is my solution, usually. Shielding is another one. You could do metal shielding. So, flight prediction. Uh, you want to, there, there's a fantastic tool a bunch of students at Cambridge designed uh, called the C, uh, CUSF uh, flight predictor, and it's that link up there. Uh, you can go in there, you punch in uh, down here on the bottom the launch altitude, the time you want to launch it, uh, the ascent rate, the rate that you're going to go up, which you calculate earlier with that calculator tool that they actually also wrote, um, the descent rate, which is what you calculate from that parachute equation, and the, t the burst altitude you expect, and this will actually grab NOAA data and simulate it almost within about 10 kilometers of the landing, dis uh, the landing spot. So it's pretty accurate. Uh, and uh, what else am I missing here? Yeah. So it's pretty accurate. And on lunch and uh, launch and recovery day, uh, you want to, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you want to do practice runs, make sure everyone's ground equipment is working. Uh, you want to test your system. Uh, have a checklist, like what you want to pack. It's, it's some of the most obvious things are easy to forget. Um, so it's really important to think that all out, have a checklist. We use that for Habix too, and it worked out great. Um, communication, make sure everyone has everyone's cell phone number. It sounds really simple, but it's like something that we almost forgot, and I had to add in last minute. And then test the radios, make sure everyone knows what happens if one channel's too busy, have a backup plan. Jeremy over there and BB, I don't know, somewhere in the car, there he is. Those two guys set up for Habix to an awesome net. We had great communication with each other. Um, and, and you just want someone to handle these things. Another important thing, by the way, is, is delegate work like, uh, or, or distribute work out to different people and not have you know, one person rely on too many systems. Uh, so they were solely responsible for you know, setting up the net. Um, give people a report uh, of what's going on. Like I, I gave everyone a printout on the day of launch. This is where we think we're going to land. These are all the teams. These are all the numbers. This is what the plan is. So everyone has a physical copy almost of, of, of what's going to happen and they don't have to memorize anything or forget. Um, note every measurement. Uh, everything from the neck lift, like as we're filling up the balloon, to know that we're getting the right amount of lift out of it, we actually had like a fishing line, or a uh, fishing, what, is it, what are they called, scales? Yeah, a scale that would, um, that would measure how much the balloon is lifting up so we can get a really accurate ascent rate. And we write that all down. Uh, the time of release, believe it or not, a lot of people forget it. Uh, where you go back, you're like, wait, wait, what time did we actually let that thing go? Um, I announced it this, when we let it go, and had it on video and I never wrote it down. So I was like, 
fumbling through all the papers trying to find it, and then I realized, I'm like, hey, wait, I could just go on YouTube and watch the time I announced. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really good idea. Um, if it lands in an easy spot, you got to be careful. If it lands in someone's backyard, like, don't go hop their fence and go get your payload. That's not a good idea. Like, ask people. They're usually really nice about it. Um, so that's something you got to be careful of. The, the desert, uh, there, it could land in a wilderness area. You can't drive into it. Habix 2 decided to do that to us. Um, and so you got you to be careful where it lands and how you're going to go recover it. Uh, and if it lands in a bad spot, regroup. Oh, yeah, you want to regroup and figure out what you're going to do. As soon as you know the landing location, that's when you regroup with all the people who are tracking and figure out how you're going to go recover this thing. So Habix 1. Um, this is the first project I brought to Null Space, uh, and this is when the Null Space Labs hackerspace just opened up in LA, um, right down the street, almost. And um, it was it was something I had been kind of working on, and it had one radio in there that was oh, actually it had two radios. I completely forgot. We had um, a an APRS uh, radio in there, and it was really like an Arduino hot glued to like a GPS, and all the wires were really crappy. There was a battery in there that was way too big. I mean, I took like one of those, like, uh, the race car batteries you buy at, like, hobby people, and threw that in there, and that thing was like half a pound on its own. This thing weighed a monstrous, like, six pounds, and I actually had to get an FAA waiver to launch it. Um, and then on top of that, uh, Arclight provided a RDF beacon that we put on there. So I was wrong, yes. There was more people than just me working on it. Um, but I didn't have anyone. I forgot. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, it's been two years. Yeah. Okay, you're, we're working on it. We're working on it. Uh, and then I didn't really have anyone look over the design. That was a big mistake. If someone had looked at this design, uh, we would have found a very important failure, um, which was, so, huh? I did. I was an idiot. <laughs> M. All right. Um, so anyway, so we, 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 we had tested it before. I had tested it before on a power supply and never really done a good full battery test. So when we got there, I plugged the battery in and it started having issues. It was like transmitting and stopped transmitting and uh, would start up again out of nowhere. And it was just really faulty. And I made the stupid decision of going ahead with it. And it was, you know, all these people have come out here. Uh, we've already filled the balloon. The balloon's being filled. Like, let's just launch it. And that was a big mistake. That picture on the right is the last time we ever saw it. <laughs> uh, for about uh, an hour and a half, we were able to track it with Arclight's RDF beacon, but it just took off, and we could not keep up with it. And we had no idea which real direction it was going in. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, yeah, we had, yeah, in search like, like we can't go out to the border of like Arizona and Nevada and California. <laughs> yeah, so um, we really tried to chase after it, but it was just really, really bad. And the failure was I used a one amp power regulator on a system that could draw up to a peak of three amps. And it turns out when you start up the radio, it will draw that peak current, if not a little more. Um, so that was a failure, but we learned from it. And there was Habix 2, two years later. Uh, it took a little while just because other projects and whatnot, but uh, we ended up having a big collaboration. This was a huge team. I can't even like list the amount of people. Uh, There's just a lot of people involved. You can try. I can try. You, if you want me to stand up here and give everybody's name, I can do my best. Um, so the Microtrack radio was. Uh, my, my part of it, which I kind of said, okay, here's this flight, uh, throw an announcement, if you want to build a part, let me know, I'll give you a mass and space on the, on the payload. And I will provide a primary radio, which I will promise it won't fail. So you can fly whatever it is, but there's still a chance it'll fail. Um, but I bought two of these, Microtrack, made by Bionics, and tested the living daylights out of the thing. Um, I beat up one of them. I gave it overvolt, undervolt, killed the GPS. Um, I messed with, I, I actually got in contact with one of the engineers who built it. And we went through, uh, and I did a circuit analysis and sent it to them of like, okay, this is what happens if the temperature gets cold. Um, you know, this 12 volt regulator isn't needed here because the power being supplied is a clean 12 volts and it's within range of all, you know, keeping all the, the parts on there powered. Um, so we really optimized it to be also battery uh, efficient, so it, it, or power efficient. And that was tested, and um, M and a few other people looked over the design. 
Um, just so, you know, got people to t take a look at it. Everything looked fine. Um, the NSL tracker built by M and Charlie back there um, was the cell phone based uh, radio that we had on Havix 2, and that worked great. And we had an RDF beacon, which that's the, that's the picture of it. I don't have a picture of the actual oh, one. Yeah. Oh, uh, one of the recovery. Huh? I think there's one of the recovery photos. That's the yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, you're right. Um, so that was the one we were going to use, but it was left on Arclight's roof on his car. So as we headed to the launch site, and it tumbled around and broke. And literally the last minute, uh, he runs up to me like, hey, do you have an Arduino? I'm like, here's an Arduino. And then he just goes off to his truck, and there's soldering going on. And pro like I see like the pro you know, Arduino IDE and he's like writing code. There's like a, a radio hot glued to it. And uh, seriously built a working beacon in less than like almost like a half an hour to an hour at most. Uh, it, was, it was crazy, but it worked perfectly. Um, and, and that was great. Uh, Vidawada Jeremy, which I don't, I don't know if he's here today, uh, built a, a cool little PCB board that uh, would record temperature, uh, acceleration, magnetometer pressure, all these really cool things that would be neat to see after the launch. Um, and that was also thrown inside this payload. And then we had a camera, because we got to take some cool pictures, obviously. Um, and it ran uh, something called CHDK which allows you, it's essentially a hacked firmware for the Canon cameras, um, and you can uh, script it to go, you know, take a few pictures, wait a little bit, sleep, okay, take some video, okay, you know, take pictures again, and you can script it to do whatever you want. Um, and then came launch day, we tied it all up, and we let it go. Uh, and, oh, yeah, actually, you can see there's a payload down below the, the pink box, there's a little yellow dot, that's the RDF beacon that was Ziploc bag, then hot glued together, and the parachute, and then the giant balloon. And then we chased it around, and uh, it was going really well for about an hour, and suddenly I see a negative velocity, and that means it's not rising. And suddenly I realized the balloon had popped, and it, was, and it popped at about 61,000 feet. It was supposed to go to 100,000 feet. And it was, the, the weather prediction told us if everything is, is calculated correctly, we will land really close to this highway in a big flat open space where we could just drive to, pick it up. It's not in a wilderness area, it's nothing crazy, you could just go get it. Um, but it decided to pop and land in somewhere in, next to Lake Havasu, a little west of Lake Havasu in the Turtle Mountains. Um, a very, very crappy place to land. Uh, it's a wilderness area, you cannot drive there, they will like send out a helicopter and tow your car away with the helicopter, from what I've heard. Uh, so, it, and it's a huge fine, like you pay a big penalty. So, we, you, you'd, you'd have to hike to get it. Uh, and we regrouped and we realized, okay, this, is, this isn't gonna work, like we, we have to come back a later day. Um, this is an analysis we did, actually, of, it, of the balloon. We took a picture and did HDR filters on it and found that the balloon was actually faulty. Um, that there's a light band going across it and the balloon that we, we recovered actually ends up having that same exact shape of where it popped from. The balloon's not supposed to come back looking like this. It's supposed to come back as like a stub. And the rest of it's supposed to be shredded apart somewhere in space. Whoa. So we had a faulty balloon. Thankfully, the guys were really nice and gave us the balloon we're going to be launching today, 50% off the next one we're going to be launching. So they're really cool about it. I'm, I'm not too upset. Um, and we ended up having to wait two weeks. Arclight and his San Bernardino search and rescue, the most awesome people in the world, uh, decided to go out there again and hike, was it 13 miles? It was a 16 round trip. 16 miles round trip in the middle of the desert. Uh, these guys are really, really you know, well trained. They do all these things all the time. They know the environment. They're not gonna go out there and, and you know, die from not having enough water or whatnot. Um, so it was a, a very good team. They ended up finding it stuck in between all these rocks. So by the way, we lost contact with it as soon as it went down below the horizon of the mountains. Uh, we're supposed to have re reception until it hit the ground, but because it was in the mountains, it never really got out. And that picture really shows why that radio signal never got out. It was buried in rocks in the middle of this valley. So we actually had to use a little bit of math and use the current data to kind of interpolate where it would have landed. And we got the, 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 land, the estimated landing location by 50 meters almost. So they showed up and were like, there it is. <laughs> and it's bright pink. So 
Um, really easy to see. And then we got back these beautiful, beautiful photos. Uh, these gorgeous photos of near space. This is one of my favorites, all the mountains. Uh, by the way, these are all on Flickr and on the Habix 2 wiki. I have a link at the end. You can go. There's a YouTube video um, slideshow with all the data on the side of, you know, how cold it was during that picture and where it is. So I got my desktop and that was, I was very happy. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it's, it really, it wouldn't have been possible without a doubt, without the big team we had. I don't have a huge, we never took a team photo, which was a bad idea, like and it never came to mind. But there was a huge, huge team, 20, 30 people. Uh, a lot of people that made this happen. So I'm really thankful to have good friends that will help out and, and contribute. So today, we're going to be launching Habix Pico. Uh, it's very, very small. Uh, sometime, I'm going to start filling the balloon in about half an hour or so. Uh, we're going to do some quick radio tests, and then we're going to let it go. This doesn't have a camera. It's just a pure radio test. It costs about $150 to do this whole thing. Um, and I ended up designing the board so it, like, it may not work, who knows? Uh, <laughs> but it, it, I've, I've been doing a lot of tests. Uh, I'm happy to test everything. Yeah, no, I really, you know what happened? It was a, a bad timeline. Um, no, but it, it has been, I actually have done a lot of testing on it um, and fixed out a lot of bugs. Uh, yesterday, I think was it yesterday, we did a, I did a final battery test, everything looked good. So we're going to launch this. Um, if you're really interested in really about uh, you know high altitude balloons, and especially if you're tested in how to do proper testing, um, I'm going to give a much more detailed talk. Uh, I barely scratched the surface, if anything, uh, for this talk about how to do proper environmental testing of electronics. But uh, if you come out to London on September 7th, there's the UK Haas conference, and uh, there'll be high altitude balloons and beer, and this is where all the people from around the world who do this sort of stuff meet up. I'm sorry? Is that the London pub over on or? No, no, no. Uh, and so special thanks to Null Space Labs for providing an awesome place to work, uh, awesome group of people who helped out, uh, the launch and recovery team, Arclight, for making all this recovery happen, and uh, the UK Haas people for really helping me out getting this board uh, sorted out. There's some links down there if you want to know more. There's a huge wiki page. I have. I spent like months on this wiki page revising it. There's great information on there on how to do this sort of stuff. Um, and then the UK Haas website, which has tons and tons of information from how, like instructional, you know, how to fill up your balloon to how to tie it off to how to do your packets and whatnot and, you know, make it work with an Arduino. So I think that's it. Yeah. So I guess we have a little bit of time for some questions. Yeah. Sure. But space, space is very cold. Space is cold. <laughs> Negative 60C if you're going to near space. Space space, I guess what? It would be like 253 Kelvin? No, wait. No, 3 Kelvin. 3 Kelvin. Whoa, that's too hot. 3 Kelvin. Space. Yeah. Are you planning on recovering the Pico? The Pico is not being planned on recovering. The, uh, it should have put that on there, actually. Um, it, because I'm doing mostly just for a radio test, and the other problem is it's the, the, the flight prediction shows it's landing in Big Bear. I'm not going to drive there. <laughs> um, if it does land in somewhere where we know where it is, I may go in a later day and pick it up. But yeah, the, yeah, there's going to be, oh, that's another really good thing to do. Um, put a shipping label on there, like a FedEx shipping label or a phone number, and be like reward or whatever on it. This one had... Yeah, it had harmless science experiment written on the side and then a phone number to call if you found it. Um, and it's my, I went just to a Google Voice. I obviously wouldn't put my own cell phone number on there. Ah. Yeah, oh, yeah, this is actually a really interesting thing. So, like, very pink, right? This is a side exposed to the sunlight for two weeks. So, Habix 2 actually sat out in the middle of the desert for two weeks. Um, and, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. Yeah. How do you test your food for those extreme temperatures? So that's a great question. Um, I, I should have put it in there, um, but it was the talk was getting too long. Essentially, there, there's different ways you can do cold testing. Um, the cheapest way to do it uh, is dry ice, or you know, just get some towels, pull the peas out of your you know freezer, wrap your electronics around it, and and let it you know get cold. 
Um, but there, there are proper ways to do it. And the real thing is you can do a cold test and you can do a vacuum test, but that's not going to tell, that's not really going to give you the information uh, or the proper testing you need. What you really need to do is both of them at the same time. And one method uh, we came up with was essentially getting any sort of chamber you can get uh, that's, that seals very well. And uh, you put your electronics inside and you, you purge it with dry nitrogen. Get, get all that air out that has moisture in it. And then you put dry ice around it to cool the, the, the dry nitrogen inside that, that chamber. Then you pump that all out. So now the inside, whatever the electronics are, are at negative 60 C or 1 I. You can use temperature probes and kind of put it together. And, and it, it's a little ghetto, but it'll work. It's cheap. Real testing and environmental testing chambers are like $10,000 or more, um, if not millions sometimes. So it's, it's very expensive stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know, man. I've seen some big. Big testing chambers. Don't you have one at work that you belong in? Actually, you're not allowed to use the ones that work for personal use. Uh, they're really nice. You can walk in them. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so essentially, and then you purge all that dry nitrogen out. It's cold, and now it's in a vacuum, and now you can do a proper test. So if, if a component's overheating, um, it's overcoming that cold temperature, and it's not dissipating the heat, and you could find out. So there's different tests you could do. A really good idea is a, a, if you have an IR camera and a little window aimed at it, and you could look at how the, the board heats up in different places. And that's why it's just, you really don't need to do it on, uh, like on a, ba a really basic uh, a board. Um, as long as you kind of lump them together with, with those, the, the materials I mentioned, it's, the, the heat's going to stay pretty constant, and you're going to be okay. Yeah. I was wondering what your ascent time was. Ascent time? It was supposed to be an hour and a half, uh, but it was actually ended up being an hour. And the descent time was about half an hour. So, yeah. Any other questions? What's up? So, if someone wanted to do this themselves, uh, how would they get started? Okay. Um, the wiki page, the, those two links are very, very good uh, links. Uh, essentially, there, there's off-the-shelf stuff you can buy, Bionics. Uh, by the way, the Habix 2 page does have links to all these things I said of like where to go buy them. I didn't want to throw them in the talk. Um, yeah? Uh, what if they do that? Uh, uh, radio lecture? Yeah. Yes. Well, so... <laughs> right. So, oh, oh, yeah. So you want to be a ham. Maybe you don't. Um, <laughs> I make fun of hams. I am one myself, but anyway. Yeah, right. Uh, there's going to be a ham test later today. I think today. Is it today? Or is it tomorrow? Today. Today. 1,800 hours. 1,800 hours. Is that Pacific Standard Time? Uh, local. Yes. Local, yes. Uh, and for those of you that can't count. Yeah, you can take the test and, and become a ham, and you're actually going to be licensed to operate in those frequencies. A lot of those frequencies I mentioned, by the way, uh, I labeled them require a ham radio license to operate in those frequencies. It's only $14. Only $14. Come on. 35 questions. Right. What? Oh, yeah, you get a free neck beard once you get the license. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, are we good? Is that? Is any other questions? Yeah. Next what? Five minutes from now. Yeah. So, yeah. So I'm going to be launching this outside in, in, during lunch. Three. When's Habix 3? Oh, Habix 3. Uh, I'm going to throw out an email with a launch uh, announcement, and I'm going to allow people to apply um, uh, things they want to fly, and then I will budget out mass and, and payload probably by the end of this year, somewhere near the end of this year. We'll do a third one. So I hope you all enjoyed that. Uh, Arco is going to be going to the pool area to do this launch. Uh, after that, you have a, an hour, I believe, for lunch. So enjoy your lunch. Come back for our next talk at uh, 1300. No, man. Thank you so much. I'm sorry? Like a business card? Yeah. I actually. Oh. I get. Uh,